from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi again. Glad to have you with us. Welcome to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis here on Can TV. So Bruce Rauner is going to fix Illinois. Finally, somebody's going to fix Illinois. It's not an easy job, but you know, Rauner's not modest about his abilities. So we'll all <laughs> enjoy watching the next couple of years to see exactly how he does it. And one of the first places to get an inkling of how he might do all that fixing is by studying the people who are going to be his closest advisors. So Melissa Harris has joined us today. Melissa from Chicago Tribune Business Column. Had, had, Glad to have you back again. You. Um, she says there are four guys that you have to keep an eye on, and um, that's because they'll probably be pl pretty influential as Rana gets started. So we'll talk to Melissa about that. Also, what happens when you own rental property and you need to make some serious repairs? You know, a new roof or a boiler, let's say, or perhaps you just want to you know, spiff the place up a little bit to make it more attractive to renters. Well, a loan might be the best way to go to get that cash, and lots of landlords do that, of course. In fact, in the wealthier parts of Chicago last year, property owners borrowed about $1.6 billion for maintenance and upgrades, more than triple what they borrowed in 2000. But let's say your property is, you know, like the 24-unit courtyard building in West Lawn or South Chicago. Well, as Micah Maidenberg has reported in this week's Cranes, that is a whole different story, and he's here to tell us about it. Micah, first time on the show. Glad to have you here from Cranes. Always good to have some Cranes people on the show. So thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So two people who report on business joining us today around the table, and we've got a lot of business to talk about because we've got a business governor now. So We do. A former <laughs> private equity executive. Yes, indeed. Multi millionaire right, right right he likes fine wine by the way did you yeah. hear about that <laughs> yes, I, I, and he <laughs> likes fine mares too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we've seen it all so you know i think that you, know, you wrote a piece just just the other day in the tribune and i think it's really true that you can sort of take the measure of a politician by the people who are in his or her kitchen cabinet and you identified a couple of guys. Couple of guys. Guys, correct. Mm -hmm. I identified four. Mm -hmm. Ron Gidwitz, John Gates, Philip O'Connor among, you know, some of them. And how many of those have you heard? How many of those names have you heard of? Well, I know Ron Gidwitz because he was, uh, you know, he was he was big in in politics for a while right. and he was the head of uh, the uh, Chicago uh, the um, community colleges. Okay. And uh, he attempted to, he was one of the first Republicans who attempted to purchase office. Uh, but let me ask you, have you heard work. of the fourth, Bill Strong? Well, I got to tell you, at first I thought you were talking about the Bill Strong, who's the public relations <laughs> guy whose right. daughter is on Saturday Night Live. No, but I'm this is not that Bill Strong. No, I'm talking the <laughs> former Morgan Stanley executive. <laughs> because I thought, really? Bill Strong? Is, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. The former Midwest chairman of Morgan Stanley. No, never heard of him. Again, no. these are not always prominent names. He's going to pull from deep within the business bench. And mm -hmm. then some of those business guys who've gone off and, you know, sold their family company companies, made their money, and have decided to stick around and help with civic issues. So mm -hmm. John Gates, chairman, former chairman of the RTA, mm -hmm. former member of the McPeer and chair of the McPeer board. Right. So that's a name you're going to know because they do more than business. But not everyone um, in his circle is going to have that mix. There are going to be some straight out meet, you know, business executives who will be a phone call away. Well, I know this isn't uh, you're not political reporters. You guys are not out there covering the day-to-day -day on this, but but it's interesting to me. I mean, I I know how superficial this is, but you know, you look at this and you say, really, four white guys, four kind of like older white guys who've been in business all this time. They couldn't couldn't they have reached at least one or two echelons beyond that. Well, let me be clear. This is not his official transition Understood. team. These four people are people who did more than just raise money for him during the campaign. They are right. people who have been involved until this point. Mm -hmm. His first act post-election was to hold a huge press conference and announced 25 members of his transition team, including prominent Democrats like Bill Daley, including prominent African Americans like Reverend James Meeks and Reverend Corey Brooks. I, two of those four gentlemen that I mentioned are on that transition team, so those are the ones you should really watch, Ron Gidwitz and John Gates. But when, you know, the transition team is diverse. It's diverse both politically, it's diverse ethnically, it's diverse racially. So, uh, you know, it remains to be seen who will actually play, you know, that full-time yeah, role. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I mean, I, I, I guess the important thing to say here is the election is over. The, you know, the people of Illinois have, some of them have spoken. Most, right. most decided to stay silent. But, but the, you know, that's over, and I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna continue to fight that, uh, that argument. Uh, now we just have to see what. Bruce Rauner is going to do, and we have to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's going to attempt to do something So worthwhile. insert the word compassion. That is not a phrase that you heard at right, all during right. the campaign, right. and so it feels a little, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know, perhaps mm -hmm. inauthentic, but uh -huh. I think that yeah. ex that spirit that you just expressed is that this new word is inserting he is theoretically going to try, or he's trying to say that he's going to try to govern Illinois in a bipartisan partisan manner. Well, so, so let's just talk a little bit about, about these, these gentlemen that you've mentioned. What is it about them that, I mean, are they personal friends of his? Are they people he's worked with for a long time? Yeah, they're personal friends. Um, you know, when you look in the Emanuel administration, I have to make the corollary to Michael Sachs, who mm -hmm. is someone your readers might not know, but he is basically a full-time member of the Emanuel administration. He yeah. is his top business advisor, yet he receives no salary. He has no official title. He, mm -hmm. you know, is the vice chairman of World Business Chicago, but he's the guy that the mayor turns to when he needs the pulse on the business community. And I think even a business governor needs some people who aren't sitting in his shoes, you know, to call. And so I think that's, you know, those mm -hmm. four are some mm -hmm. of those people. They all um, go back to his GTCR days, you know, when he was um, an executive of a, one of the city's largest private equity firms, investment firms. Yes, we know about his history at GC, yeah. GTCR. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, well, at, at the risk of beginning to go down that road, which, which I don't want to go down, we'll just we'll just leave it at that, I guess, and just say uh, this is going to be very interesting to watch. Um, but I, I guess I can't resist but saying that I hope he's going to have his finger on a few pulses other than the business community when he gets right. when he gets he rolling. Knows business. There are lots of other pulses to take. Yeah, he knows business, and he has a deep political team, um, and many of them are, are have already been announced as they will be transitioning with him into the governor's office. But at the same time, when he holds his first press conference, the only mm -hmm. thing he talks about is jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like he's he talks about jobs. He talks about taxes. He talks about property taxes. He talks about, um, you know, economic improvement and growth, jobs, jobs, jobs. And so I think that they're going to be have to be a key part because his agenda is around economic growth. Yeah, and he's also got this hundred billion dollar deal that he's got to figure out if he's going to fix Illinois. Exactly. Right. And uh, you sound. Uh, you're a reporter, so I, I always have to be very delicate about this, but I must say from your, your level of enthusiasm, you sound like you're willing to give this guy a shot that you think he might have a shot at making a difference. Is that, is that a fair statement? He hasn't done anything yet, so I'm not willing to. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, have me back in a few months, and then right. I will have but, some. But you, I'm but sure do, I will have some strong to be, You do seem to be sort of hooking into the optimism, the compassion and all that, it sounds like. No? All right. Okay. All right. All right. Enough. <laughs> Enough. Were you going to say something? No. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I, I think every elected official brings in like a, a kitchen cabinet, as, as Melissa has reported. I, I know the, you know, those guys presumably will be kind of ambassadors to, you know, the business community, which uh, is, is on kind of pins and needles about, you know, pensions and, and how that will be resolved. I know commercial de real estate developers who we cover pretty closely um, are, are wondering how that will affect them and um, because they have, you know, buildings that can't move and, mm -hmm. and presumably uh, some kind of, um, uh, any kind of pension resolution will presumably, you know, involve kind of commercial property you know, rates and taxes. A lot of money is tied up in commercial real estate too, right? I mean, as, as investments and all yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's kind of a, a, a separate kind of issue, but just in terms of like raising new revenue, I mean, I know commercial property owners are wondering how that will affect mm -hmm. them. And I imagine um, between the, the Ronner administration and, and some of, of folks in that industry, those conversations are, are already ongoing. Yeah, I mean, I. I just can't imagine, but that these guys would be delighted with this with this development. It's got to be a better situation than they would have had if than they would have perceived to have had if Quinn had been reelected. He has pledged to keep the property tax flat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll see. 
Okay, all right. Well, I, I was, I, I must say, I was really fascinated with your, your Crane's piece, uh, Micah, the thing about, uh, okay, about this kind of disparity in lending. And I, and I guess the, the, the question that I have to ask you mm -hmm. is whether this is a, is, is this a big picture thing that is parallel to so many of the other discussions we have about racial disparities and class disparities, whether it's, you know, arrests for marijuana and everything else. Are we seeing that reflected in commercial lending here, that, that if you want to build an apartment building in River North, no problem, well, here's some money, and if you want to fix up your place in West Lawn, not uh, so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, like the, what, uh, you know, my story covered and what DePaul's Institute on Housing, you know, r revealed is that the uh, uh, loans for, you know, apartment buildings around the city, there's, there's a pretty um, uh, uh, clear sort of gap between higher income and lower income areas. I mean, mm -hmm. to be clear, these are loans for acquisitions of, of uh, multifamily buildings for uh, refinancing them and for for repairs, they mm -hmm. they wouldn't cover like a construction run right, that right. you know would fund a, a new River North you know mm -hmm. residential tower. Right. Um, yeah, so there there it, it does sort of fit into this pattern of you know the tale of two cities that that comes out in lots of different ways um, uh, here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I mean the. This is another one of these weird kind of chicken and egg things because you have landlords who mm -hmm. own properties in these distressed areas. If they can't get money to fix the windows and fix the roofs and so on, then the property deteriorates even further. And people who can't afford any kind of a rent increase are, are, are then get stuck in these buildings that are deteriorating and no one can fix them and and the whole cycle just continues to devolve I mean so I guess the question is why why is this are, are these are these buildings just bad investments I mean if, if you're the guy who's sitting on a couple of billion dollars in your bank vault why don't you want to give loans here why, why would you be reluctant um, well you know uh, one uh, representative of the banking industry kind of pointed to um, Increased regulatory uh, requirements since uh, the crash several years ago. Um, there is certainly um, more uh, demand in some neighborhoods, and in some higher income neighborhoods, and some lower income neighborhoods that have seen a lot of population loss. So, so there's sort of a, a, a just a mathematical almost um, kind of disparity. But there's also, you know, lo you know, banks are are, and we're talking about bank lending here. Are you know they're cautious and they. And probably rightfully so. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of real estate owners and uh, rental building owners clearly got over their skis before the crash and took yeah. out probably too much money on these buildings. And 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 there's hesitation now. I mean, if a bank, you know, if they're looking at making a loan, they have to ask themselves, you know, if this goes belly up and we foreclose and take back the property, can we sell the property? What are we gonna? You know, it's easier to sell. A, a 20 unit apartment building in Lakeview than it is in, in kind of these more distressed you know markets so but, but just to be clear though this this thing about onerous regulation which we hear all the time sure I don't remember them drawing lines around the map and saying the onerous regulations will only be out here and when when you're at uh, you know um, North and Sheffield or something uh, the regulations won't be as onerous I mean it's the same everywhere right uh, right, but the the difference is in in kind of more or wealthier areas, rents are rising, building values are are rising. Um, the apartment market in the city uh, and, and lots of places in Cook County is really booming right now, and um, you know that makes it easy to to lend into. Um, mm. it, so so we're kind of talking about this. We sort of come back to these uh, these string theories, theories of everything, because this is one of these about the just the um, the growing disparity in income in. I, I should point out, States. Kent, that I mean the good news is you know lending is is up from the trough. I mean it's definitely um, it's more than doubled in, in weaker market or lower income neighborhoods. Even in the weaker markets, according to DePaul, yeah, it, it's yeah. really surged in the higher income neighborhoods. It's just not. It's and going up here and over here. It's going up like this, but it, but they're both. So the the question is, are are the the, the landlords in some of these um, you know lower income areas are high, you know can they get capital that they need and yeah, and yeah. some of them clearly are. There's there's no yeah. question about that. You know, um, 
perhaps apropos of nothing, but I, I, I read in something you wrote about recently, <laughs> a quote that I just had to bring up today. And I, I, I don't even know, you'll have to attribute it for me because I don't even know who said this, but <laughs> Americans who were under 35 in 1995, okay? Americans who were under 35 in 1995 earned wages that were 9% higher today th than today after adjusting for inflation. So if you're under 35 today, you're earning 9% less than, you, than your 35-year-old peers in your parents, I guess it would have been if it was 1995. I'm 34, I'm technically a millennial. My generation will likely be the first generation that, to not do as well as their parents. It's remarkable. Period. I mean, we've End been talking about that for a while, but it really does now look like it's become reality, right? And you know, and what you're seeing is you're seeing difficulties acquiring jobs right out of graduation. Mm -hmm. It starts from the beginning. Right, right. What people don't understand is that that money that you earn, it compounds. Mm -hmm. So if you struggle right from the beginning, you are going to be at a disadvantage Absolutely. when you're mm -hmm. 70, and it is right, nearly right. impossible to catch up. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the student loans, which is something my generation right. didn't have to which deal with. Which now exceeds credit card debt. Mm -hmm. Right. Now right. exceeds right. credit card debt. As mm -hmm. someone who is currently in graduate school, I feel the pain mm -hmm. of every 20-year-old right, in right, America. Right. As I often like to say to my 20-something friends, <laughs> we had it really well. We had a really good time. And uh, while you're at it, make sure you fix the uh, climate and, uh, <laughs> and all those other things we left behind. But, you know, it was really, it was a good run you while know, we had it. Growth, uh, you know, masks over a lot of the problems, yeah. right? If you have yeah. a growing economy, all of those other problems kind of just get fixed. If your wages are rising, the, it is the key to you know sustained personal mm -hmm. um, and professional right. wealth right. It, it, without a rising wage. And that's been a, a kind of a, a, a theme of this recovery is that even as the the job jobless rate mm -hmm. sort of takes down, like wage growth is really stagnant. And, and it's and a theme of the Democratic Party. I mean, yeah. why do you think they ran national campaigns mm -hmm. and are still to raise the minimum wage, right? It's <laughs> if, if, if you won't grow, if businesses, if you won't grow yourself, if you won't pay your people more, we're going to demand that you pay mm -hmm. people more. Mm -hmm. That's the strategy. Right. That's mm -hmm. how to push, you know, the bottom, you know, quartile up just a little bit more. Whether that will work in the long run, mm -hmm. it remains to be seen. One of the things, I, boy, are we really off on the deep end <laughs> here, but one of the things that has always puzzled me about this is that in the 30s, when similar situations were occurring, the, the response that seemed universally appropriate was for the government to create work. Correct. And to pay people to do things that today, imagine today, the federal government saying we're going to create an artist program and we're going to have people go around and and interview people and we paint do have the national and, endowment for the yeah, arts yeah but it's which not it's not that, quite that right. that money goes to pbs right. <laughs> so, yeah. but you know i mean seriously I, I i've never understood and and you guys maybe can educate me on this doesn't that actually in the long run help if you just take money and pay people for a while to do things. Going back to college history, World War II, though, was what brought us out of the Depression. I agree. It's right, not, those right. programs uh, were not going to permanently fix, like, the structural problem of, you know, America's economy during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And the difference today is that, as before, when a, um, you know, a big airplane, a bomber, would require 500 workers. Mm -hmm. Today, it might require 100 workers. Right, right. And those jobs are never coming, coming back. back. Right. Ever. Remember that, kids. Those jobs are never coming never back. Never coming back. And you, and again, of course, I mean, this is a question about, you know, a stimulus program on the federal level. I mean, that's some of the most contested right. political debate and rhetoric there is. And, right, and, right. and I don't know if we need to get into the gridlock in, in D.C., but, you know. Well, I mean, it, it, sure. everything is everything. Everything's tied together. But it's interesting that you think about one of the few stimulus programs that, that everybody got behind was repairing and rebuilding roads, right? But it's the same thing. I mean, you, you see a crew, you know, you, I mean, I, what was that major? It was Foster, I guess. They did Foster, like, from right. one end of the city to the other. And I swear to God, there were 15 people working on that job because <laughs> it's just giant machines that right. come and scrape everything up. And, and the whole job's done three times faster than it was done before, much more efficiently and with no workers. The profits go to what's scarce. The profits go to what's scarce. So labor is not scarce. Mm -hmm. Therefore, 
labor will not receive yeah. The, yeah. the reap the benefits. Yeah. Yeah. This it ripples out in in in, in ways and you know, someone might be covering like retail property mm -hmm. when we see, like I had a story a couple of days ago about uh, Lincoln Mall in Matson. I was going to ask it's you It's going to close right, in, right. in early January and mm -hmm. it's struggled for years with, um, you know, uh, allegedly owner, previous owners that didn't keep up the property. But, mm -hmm. you know, Matson is in a tough area in the south suburbs where, you know, spending and middle class mm -hmm. kind of incomes have uh, mm -hmm. Stagnated, I believe, and I mean, I think it's a, it's in it's right in the sweet spot of that kind of middle market yeah. world that's just in general, it's not just Matson and Lincoln Mall, but just struggled out it's of just imploded the, the, market the recession. And when yeah. you think about its scarcity, that mall had a monopoly on essentially clothing in Madison. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, it had yeah. a monopoly. Very successful. Right, yeah. and that monopoly, thanks to the internet, is completely mm -hmm. gone. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> as, you've, as you've discerned, ladies and gentlemen, there's no theme today's show at all. It's just like a couple of business reporters who are really smart. We're just, so, is, are malls like LP vinyl? Are, are they gonna are they gonna collapse to a certain point and then there's gonna be a resurgence like 20 years from now people saying wow you know it's really kind of cool to go to a place where you can go and see all this stuff I, I, I just kind of get this feeling that um, we're we're seeing the, the end of, of physical shopping but but the, 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 the end answer, won't be complete the answer is a, is like maybe I mean yeah. the, the the top tier malls like in the Chicago area like Oak Brook Center. Uh, North, I mean, they're thriving. They've Are never, they thriving? yeah, they've never had better. They're doing great. You know, when investors buy them, they're trading hands at at mm -hmm. record prices. They're doing really well. Mm -hmm. It's the the middle market and and. The, the sort of lower end malls that are, are really struggling. And that, again, t I mean, it sort of maps on to this broader conversation about it's a really interesting, where money is. It's a really in interesting issue you're flowing. raising because I'm thinking of um, uh, Water Tower Place for Water one. Water Tower Place is and, thriving. And uh, yeah. uh, Old Orchard and places like that, Westfield Old Orchard Shopping Town. Um, these places appear to me to be thriving, but they're thriving because they've got Apple stores and restaurants and theaters and stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure you see that many people going to the, the traditional stuff of the, you know, the clothing stores and the knickknack stores. Th those, uh, that, that seems, it seems like that's pretty much over. I, yeah, I mean, the, the, the kind of merchandise makeup of, of these malls is, is definitely changing. And, mm -hmm. and the, the, the Tribune it, uh, had a story uh, a couple months ago, I think, about how you know, general growth at some of its properties here is doing like same day pickup. Mm -hmm. People can order online, right, pick up right, at the mall, right. and then they stay and you know rack up a bill at a, a new restaurant <laughs> that's just opened or yeah, you know something yeah, like yeah. that. Um, it, it, re restaurants are definitely becoming a more important part in these properties. The idea is to become kind of like a guide shop, right? Mm -hmm. It's like right, you go in, you right. get to feel the product right. because you. Although technology will catch up where we can almost feel yeah. the product on yeah. our screen, yeah. it's not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's called haptics, called tangible haptics, when you can actually feel what the mm -hmm. pair of jeans looks right. like right. by touching your screen. But we're not there yet, so people still want to touch, they still want to feel, they still want to sit in the Tesla, but they're going to go to a little iPad there and mm -hmm. they are going to order it online in the store and then with same day delivery they're going to have it within 24 hours. Yeah. And yeah. that will save them on inventory, it will save them on mm -hmm. shipping, it will save them on logistics costs, mm -hmm. costs and so it will mm -hmm. increase their margins. Alternatively, the the, the, in, the jargon in retail is, is showrooming. Show you know, people right. will, right. will go in and, and, and check stuff out and get advice and then Best go home buy. and buy it online. <laughs> right. You know, and, and so right. some retailers I know are trying to sort of, you know, really boost their customer service to kind of encourage that, say, yeah. thinking a sale is a yeah. sale, whether it's here or, or through our website. Yeah. So that also is a part of this thing we were talking about just before we went on about globalization, which I, we have like a couple of minutes left and we might as well tackle the biggest issue that there is <laughs> because almost everything you're talking about has something to do with globalization, doesn't it? I mean, uh, you almost can't tell me a malady that we're facing that I can't trace back to the fact that we have now just become one planet, one planetary market, which means that rich older countries like us we just have to we just have to accept that we're going down in the pecking order the line that i always give people is all politics is local that's mm -hmm. like you know but all business is global mm. we are not the maker 
of things mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. America is not the maker of things anymore. Mm-hmm. China is the maker of things. Mexico is the maker of things. That is a structural change in our economy that we are still grappling with. That does not mean we can still not be a global leader. Mm-hmm. That does not mean we still can't be the most thriving economy in the world, but it is going to take a greater investment in education, which this company is currently, uh, this company, this country is currently not making. <laughs> we won't even you know, touch that. When I was thinking about what, <laughs> what the, the sort of real estate angle with globalization is, and maybe maybe one can is, um, and you know, the investors that are coming here from overseas mm-hmm. to, to buy, you know, when a, a, a German investor buys an office building downtown or mm-hmm. a group of Brazilian you know, right. uh, folks buy a shopping center on the south side. Yeah. I mean, that that's that's belief yeah. in, in Chicago. That's belief in, in kind of the economy that's here That's very interesting future. because we used, They're to, betting on us. we used to think of that as a horrible threat, as a, as a kind of an insurgence of yeah. some kind. Now, as you say, the Brazilians buy a shopping center and we say, oh, well, we must be worth something. But why the is Brazilians that happening? Just... Because growth in China and Brazil is actually slowing, mm-hmm. right? So they're having to search right. elsewhere just like we right. have had to search elsewhere, right, right. for increased returns. Right, right. And um, we... Well, yeah, it's 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 all part of the same thing. I mean, w- when when you can ship something from one part of the world to the other as inexpensively as if you built it in the same city, mm-hmm. then it just changes the whole dynamic. Yeah. So it was those it was those uh, container ships that did it to us, wasn't it? That that's 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 what lowered our cost of living. <laughs> they just keep getting bigger too. You they know, do. it's yeah. fascinating yeah. to read about we, we keep how canals, canals are <laughs> growing to accommodate them. Yeah. Yeah. To accommodate right. the bigger ships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I don't know where I don't know where to let this end because it just I, I just remember that when I was in seventh grade, the smartest person I ever met was a Chicago public school teacher, a Union Chicago public school teacher, by the way who uh, leaned back on his chair and said, you will be the first people in American history who will not have enough jobs to go around because machines and everything else will replace, will you. replace you. So there will be many, many of you who will not be able to find jobs when you are older. And The people, if I could give any advice to a 16-year-old out there, it's the people who will program the machines who will still survive. Yeah, but there's only going to be four or five machines, and there'll be seven people programming them. So (laughs) It'll be more than that. Yeah, okay, all right. And on that optimistic note. (laughs) More more than seven, right? (laughs) <laughs> well, but there's only going to be there's only going to be seven, six corporations running the world, and there'll be the, you know the fall of the state. There will be there will be few less need for countries because Exxon and Apple will will run. Oh, stop I'm it! Not that no, pessimistic. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to now we're going into the border no, of actually. Uh, actually I take a, it's Google that's going to be. Watch Google. They're going to run the whole place. Let's just say I interstellar recently. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm that. seeing that on Friday, by the way. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Gotta we'll go see that. Right. It's a little. Bleak. Thank you so much, Micah, for being here from uh, Crane Chicago Business. Thanks really for having enjoyed me, having you. And, and thanks again, of course, Melissa too. We'll we'll talk to you both soon. Cool. You have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. We're here to make you feel more optimistic about your future. (laughs) And you can find us here on cable or in the great vast internets. You can check us out right here anytime you want on iTunes. We'll be back next week with another show. Talk to you later on Ken Davis. Thanks. Bye-bye.